Good morning. Can you hear me? Loud and clear? Good. It's a great day. Did you know that? Absolutely. It's a wonderful day to be here at worship and to share. I'm just very grateful. Um, many, many, many of you knew Janelle Sifford, and we will celebrate her resurrection. It's going to be a graveside service today at 2 o'clock. Our heart is with Tom, with Eric, with Nancy, and just the whole family right now. But uh, just loved her. There are a, a number of handouts. The lunch, the Easter flowers. This is the last Sunday, I think, to be able to sign up for the flowers, the geraniums, and the lilies. So if you want to give one in honor or in memory of someone, you need to do that. And then the Easter celebration on March 27th. I'm kind of excited about that. I think that's going to be great. This coming Wednesday, over the, the Lenten season, I have been taking you to the places of the Passion. This Wednesday, at both the noon service and the seven, we will take you to Pilate's Judgment Hall. And we learn a whole lot from that scene. We also will learn a great deal about a guy named Barabbas. He was set free, and Jesus was crucified. So I cannot begin to tell you how important these services are to me personally and to be able to share it with you. It's the fifth Sunday in Lent, and next Sunday is Palm Sunday. So we begin Holy Week um, on Maundy Thursday and on Good Friday. I will have a 12 o'clock service uh, on both days and the, obviously the 7 p.m. service. So I just wanted to know. The other thing I wanted to point out to you, Becky, Lippert, good morning and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome her. Where's her hubby? Okay. Um, the musical, uh, I started doing a number of months ago, a musical reflection, time to be quiet after you've made confession. There is a song that Becky's going to play called Drawn to the Light, written by John, uh, John Yilvesacker. Uh, it's a beautiful song. I think this may be the first time you've heard it in worship, but I know you'll be blessed by it. Would you now please rise, that we may make confession unto God. Let our service begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On these days of Lenten journey, Christ goes with us side by side. While we gather here for worship, May our lives be focused with praise and care. As we worship and listen, may God's Spirit deep within us come alive. And now in this time of worship, let us go to the Lord in silence and make our own personal confession of sin. Father, I thank you, for you hear our personal confession and our pleas. And now as a family in Christ, we confess together. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For his sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, so that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us. And for his sake, he forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ, and by his authority and his authority alone, I pronounce to you the entire for forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated as we listen to Drawn to the Light. <laughs> Almighty God, look favorably upon your family. Graciously rule our bodies, lest we are enticed to love the world. And guard our spirits, lest we fail to recognize your love. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thus says the Lord, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is... The covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Let us now read responsively from Psalm 119. How shall a young man cleanse his way by keeping to your words? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commandments. I treasure your promise in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Instruct me in your statutes. With my lips will I recite all the judgment, judgments of your mouth. I have taken greater delight in the way of your decrees than all manners of riches. I will mediate on your commandments, meditate on your commandments, and give attention to your ways. My delight is in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 
The second reading comes to us from the book of Hebrews. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, as he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications, with loud cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the readings. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent is recorded in the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. The disciples were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do? And they said, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I will drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Gracious Lord, I pray that the thoughts and the words that I proclaim this morning would be in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Really an unusual discussion Jesus is having with James and John. And they said to Jesus, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. 
And Jesus said, you do not know what you're asking. Apparently the motivation is pretty self-centered, wouldn't you say? You know, for a couple of days, I've just been thinking, ruminating about that verse. Now, we all know that the disciples are clueless when it comes to understanding the kind of Messiah that Jesus will be. He's not going to be a military Messiah who will overthrow the Roman Empire. That's not going to happen. And it is in Mark's gospel that he gives at least recorded three times. Probably it happened more often than that, but we have three recordings. In which... Jesus says that he will suffer, he will be spit upon, mocked, crucified, but on the third day rise. But they never get it. You know that, and I do too. Nothing actually hits home, and they go, I understand, until the day of the resurrection. After that, they will begin to understand. But for the time being, they walk around with Jesus, And then they choose not to trust him to see the light that he has been showing them in all of his teachings and his miracles and his ministry. But I don't think they're alone. I think that's a fairly graphic description of us as well. But the sad thing about us is that we know the end of the story and we choose to continue to walk in darkness. Trusting in Jesus is everything, but do we? Last Sunday, I stood here and I told you a story. I told you a story as a little boy when I went to the Luray Caverns and we went down deep into the cavern And unbeknownst to us, the guide, he told us to stand close to each other, to be absolutely silent, and then he flipped a switch. And we were plunged into a darkness I'd never experienced before or since. And then I told you that I put my hand in front of my nose and I couldn't see it. Mm. I was scared. And then I said, darkness can do that. You know, I had to trust that the guide would bring us back into the light. If the Christian faith teaches you and I anything, it teaches us, regardless of your circumstances, to trust in the Lord. If you're serious about faith and trust, you will find that faith and trust is a decision. It is a, in many ways, it is a daily decision. It's not just a one-time leap of faith. I mean, that can happen. But by and large, it's the decisions that you and I make depending on the circumstances in which we're living. It's the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. And Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows exactly what awaits him. Listen. Jesus and the disciples were on the road, and they're walking. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest's scribes, and they'll condemn him, mock him, spit on him, kill him, and on the third day rise. Now, wouldn't you think that Jesus' best friends, whom he loved so much that he confided in them and told them that he was going to die, a gruesome, horrible death, don't you think that they would give him their utmost attention? You do know, at least I hope you know, life is fragile. Life is really fragile. Do you know that decisions that you might make in the next moment could be as close as your next breath, serious decisions. Monday, I was here doing what I'm supposed to do. My phone rang, and it was my wife. 
And Ann said, Tom, I'm driving myself to the emergency room in Pineville. Well, what do you think Tom did? You think I got in my car? <laughs> Terry said, went that way. You got that one. I got in my car, and I drove. I didn't go crazy, but I drove, and I didn't stop for a second. Pulled into the parking deck at Atrium Pineville, and I'm walking to the ER when my phone goes off again. It was Pat Riddle. Pat Riddle is the pastor of St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in Lexington, South Carolina, that I had the honor of serving for ten and one-half years. It was an amazing journey. But he called to tell me that my former secretary, Vicki, that her beloved husband, Warner, had only a few more months to live. A couple of years ago, he had a double lung transplant. But things changed, and he was taken to Duke. And he, Pat told me he only had a few months to live. I was in contact with Vicki. Warner came home yesterday in an ambulance because he was too weak to be driven in a car, and he's been given days, maybe a week, two at the most. Life is fragile. Jesus tells his closest friends what is on his heart and what's on their mind. Well, Jesus, we want to sit one here and one here on either side in your glory. Apparently, they didn't hear a word that he said. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking, I wonder what the Son of God felt like concerning these men who obviously were clueless. Well, as I was writing this sermon and trying to think, my mind went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and we get a clue of how he felt. Matthew 26, 40, 41, And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping in the garden. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for even one hour? Watch and pray, that you may not enter in temptation, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. You know what? I think that Jesus was deeply disappointed by those he called his best friends. But I don't think for a second he was surprised at all. In the end, everyone will abandon him except for the one in John's gospel who is identified as the disciple he loved and that was actually John himself. So now I take you to the foot of the cross. And standing is the one disciple who didn't abandon him. It is John. Listen. John 19, 25, 27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, Standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple John, Behold your mother. And from that hour, he took her to his home. Scholars believe that John might have actually cared for Jesus' mother, Mary, for as long as 15 years before she died. We don't know the time frame. But one thing is for sure, that time frame ended when he was banished to the Isle of Patmos, where he would write the book of Revelation. The time before the cross, as depicted in Mark, is filled with darkness. Darkness defined as being blind to the obvious suffering death of Jesus. Blind to his warnings and predictions. And of course we know light will come in the early mornings on Sunday morning. 
the early hours. Darkness will give way to resurrection light. But John gives us a preview. In spite of all the darkness in our world, light will overcome. Now, this is not in my sermon, but it's coming out of my mouth. I grew to love Janelle Sifford, Tom Sifford, especially their son, Eric. When you're standing and holding the hand of a person who is dying, I'm telling you, they need hope beyond their present suffering. Revelation 21. And I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon or shine to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. And its light will, and by its light the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. Until that time, you and I are called to be bearers of the light right here in Rowan County. People of Oregon, my dear people, for as long as the Lord calls me to be your interim, pastors in the past, and I promise you, this man has called you over and over again to bear witness to the light here in Rowan County. In fact, every time I get in the pulpit, you probably get bored stiff because I challenge you every Sunday. Sound like a broken record. I'll die with a broken record and challenge you. If the gospel is to be proclaimed rightly here in Ryan County, you and I have the responsibility of bearing the light. Now, if you don't do that within the sphere of your own influence, then darkness will continue. And that's wrong. But now your question, which is silent, but your question, I hope, is how in the world do we do that? I mean, is there a special course we can take? Folks, you do it one person at a time. One. I wonder, have any of you all ever invited anyone to come here to Oregon Lutheran for one purpose, and that is to meet Jesus? You ought to do that sometime. Use those words. They'll look at you like you're crazy. You should do it anyway. Because that's the hope every one of you should have. John Yilvesacher wrote that song, Drawn to the Light. And I believe that if we listen to the words, the message comes through. People who walk in darkness have sought a light in the heart of the darkest night. Just when we thought all would be lost, we were drawn to the light of God. How can we tell a heaven from hell if everyone dwells in the dark of night? Morning dispels, gently compels, and we're drawn to the light of God. Lord Jesus, my prayer is that we will feel a sense of urgency and peace that we might help others to be drawn to the light. Shine, shine, Jesus, shine through your, chi your children. Flood the nations with your grace and mercy. 
Send forth your word and use us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise and let us profess our historic faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious Lord, we come before you now in prayer, and we give you praise for that incredible privilege to come before the throne of grace with those things that are on our hearts. We walk into Oregon this morning, Lord, the sun is shining so beautifully, the light is going through beautiful stained glass windows, and the light falls on us. May that become a symbol of the light that we carry out into your world. Father, we pray for our church that we might be faithful to you. We pray for the NALC and all churches that they may follow what you command and be the light in this darkened world. I pray for our call committee as they seek a permanent full-time pastor. And Father, you already know that person. So I pray that you will give everyone patience as we journey together, and I thank you for the privilege of journeying along with them. Gracious Father, we pray for our country. There is so much evil going on. There are policies and decisions being made that are affecting hundreds of thousands of people. We need discernment, and we need light, and for this we pray. Father, we lift up special prayer for Jim Lober on the death of his father, Charles, and just to anoint him with your peace. I pray for Dennis Holzhauser as on Wednesday he has surgery in Chapel Hill and that there will be healing and renewed strength for him. We pray for the family of Janelle Sifford, that you would just be with Tom, Eric, and Nancy and all, especially as we celebrate her resurrection today. We also want to remember Sylvia Poster. We ask that you would just touch her body. She is not well, Father. And her son Randy is in the hospital now in Charlotte to get a pacemaker. And so we pray that you would touch both mom and son with your healing presence. We offer this prayer and all our prayers in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. Having given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Father, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please now take your communion cup, remove the label, and receive the bread. The body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given and broken for you. Please remove the tab. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve each one of you into eternal life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>